to drink or not to drink, it's a decision that every teenager has to make at some point. For some, it's an easy call. They're comfortable with themselves and confidently doing what they know is right. Drinking is very popular in high school. It's like the thing to do, but I don't drink. I surround myself with people who don't drink because it keeps me from drinking. For others, it means standing up to peer pressure. Walk in the door, somebody hands you a beer. Tell me you don't want it. Oh, come on, you got to. There's no question that this is a difficult decision, but it is one that can shape the rest of your life. I was 13 when I first started drinking regularly. Only friends I had were the friends that drank like me, and they weren't real friends. You know, once I got sober, I never heard from them again. Throw drinking and driving into the mix, and the consequences can be deadly. I cannot imagine a worse experience than losing your child. It's not normal to have to bury your child. Attend one funeral, and you've attended one funeral too many. So, what's the story with teens and alcohol? Who drinks and why? And what does drinking do to a person's body, that person's life, and the lives of those around them? From music videos to advertising on billboards and TV, there's an image out there that makes drinking seem not only acceptable, but an easy way to be part of the in crowd. The simple truth, it's anything but. Young people get the message in this society that drinking is not really a big deal, that it's a rite of passage, that everybody does it. I think a lot of times in advertising, you know, you, when you see people having fun or, you know, girls with their boyfriends or just playing on the beach and just laughing and giggling, I think that's definitely a target for teenagers because teenagers would love to experience that. But what beer commercial shows the DUI? What beer commercial shows um, the car accident? Or the angry family member because somebody got in trouble or cracked up the car or didn't show up when they said they were going to. Teens are, uh, are um, you know, drawn into advertisements for alcohol that's fruity, that's sweet, that, that has fun names attached to it. They're easier to consume and you don't really think that there's that much alcohol in them when you're drinking them. Manufacturers uh, can mask alcohol to make it more uh, palatable. Uh, there's uh, apple ciders that are out there. Um, a lot of vodka manufacturers are making citrus drinks now. And all the messages that our kids hear that, that alcohol is okay, it's not. It's not. It, it's, it's a deadly choice and it's, it's a scary choice. But you can't blame the media for everything. And when it comes to sheer influence, most teens would probably point a finger at their friends and peers. The common uh, misperception of peer pressure is that it involves kids going to parties and other kids saying, here, drink this or do that. Uh, the reality is that peer pressure comes from within. It comes from wanting to do what everybody else is doing. It comes from a sense of wanting to go along to get along. I always wanted to fit in wherever I was at. I always wanted to be accepted. For most people, um, at least initial alcohol use occurs in a social context whether it's kids hanging on a corner drinking some beers or young adults going out to a club on a Friday night, there's a social element to the drinking. But for some kids, drinking alcohol meets a deeper need. For them, alcohol is not just for socializing, but to escape from serious psychological or emotional problems. When you ask young people why they drink, uh, probably 98% of them will tell you right off the cuff to have fun. Uh, but when you dig a little deeper, when you drill down on those answers, you find out that there's a lot of kids who drink uh, because they're self-medicating, because they're not feeling too good about themselves, because they're not feeling too good about what's happening in their lives. Alcohol, I used it to escape depression for a short time, and then it would actually add to my depression and anxiety. Like, it would, it would be a quick fix, and then the next day, I'd be even more depressed and more anxious. I had a lot of fear inside me and you know, a lot of bottled up emotions and it, it allowed me to let them, let them all out. Unfortunately, a big part of the problem with alcohol is that the image that we get about its use isn't all that frightening. But when you strip back the pretty faces and the good times portrayed in beer commercials, there's a lot about alcohol to be afraid of, especially when you examine how alcohol works. Alcohol is a drug, 
a member of the family of drugs known as depressants, which typically slow down all the body's functions. Alcohol affects each person differently based on a variety of factors, all of which have to do with the process by which the body deals with alcohol once it's been ingested. The alcohol, of course, is, is taken through, it's taken orally through the mouth and it goes through the esophagus and then it goes into your GI tract where it's very quickly absorbed by your stomach lining. And from there, your bloodstream distributes it throughout your whole body. The body can process about one drink per hour. That's one beer, one glass of wine, or one shot of liquor. Anything over that intake, you start building up alcohol in your system. There's a time gap between when you've consumed the alcohol and when it actually gets to your brain. That adolescents may not have learned that, so they may be drinking and it may be accumulating in their stomach. And then, when they think like, I gotta stop now, it's really still in their stomach going into their brain. Generally, with limited dosage, alcohol acts as a stimulant. People feel a sense of euphoria and disinhibition. So with one or two drinks, people may feel up, they may feel that they can party, be more outgoing. After that, it generally depresses all the major body functions, respiration, heart rate, um, and also, in general, depresses the mind. For most individuals, approximately 120 pounds, three or four drinks is enough to cause legal intoxication. And at that point, the individual may have slurred speech, beginning signs of some impaired gait. They may be unsteady on their feet. By the time I got home from parties, I was usually throwing up. I wouldn't be able to fall asleep because my room would be spinning around. I would have really, really bad hangovers the next day. It was awful. Like, it made me never want to drink again. With higher levels of intoxication, individual may ultimately experience a blackout, which is a unique phenomenon in which um, the brain short circuits so that people may be engaged in behaviors and have no recollection of what they're doing. Also being such a strong disinhibiting agent, people do things they wouldn't otherwise do and say things they wouldn't otherwise say. One of the really important things to understand about alcohol is it affects each person differently. If you think of it as a percentage of your body weight, uh, big people can drink more than smaller people and have the same effect. But even even two people who are the same size, you might expect equal effects, they can respond quite differently to the same amount of alcohol. There are also going to be a lot of other factors, too, just in terms of like how much sleep you've gotten, if, you're inter if it's interacting with any other substances, uh, how much food you have in your system. All those can be determinants in terms of how a drink is affecting you. Regardless of these factors, once the drinking starts, alcohol travels into the bloodstream and then to the brain. The amount of alcohol in a person's system can be easily determined. It's called the blood alcohol level. And very simply, it measures the percentage of total blood content that is alcohol. The fact is, it doesn't take much alcohol in the blood to have an effect on a person's behavior. At a blood alcohol level of 0.06 to 0.1%, your reaction time begins to slip. At 0.11 to 0.15, speech begins to slur. At this level, emotions are poorly controlled and judgment is reduced. At blood alcohol levels of 0.22 to 0.25, the person feels groggy, begins to stagger, has difficulty talking, and probably experiences blurred vision. And if that doesn't sound like enough fun, at a level of 0.4, a drinker can begin to slip into a coma. At 0.5 or higher, breathing stops and death occurs. This is alcohol poisoning. And in teens, this is often brought about as a result of extreme bouts of binge drinking. Binge drinking is drinking to get drunk, and too often among teens, it results in big trouble for both the body and the mind. Teenagers and young adults tend to binge, and depending on um, the setting, we usually define that as drinking either four or five drinks in one setting. Adolescents definitely drink for effect. They want to get drunk, so they, they want to, you know, sort of, you know, pound down as much as they possibly can. When I drink, I drink to get drunk, and the more and more you drink, after a certain point, you just keep drinking and drinking, and you get more crazy or more out of control. Like, I was being stupid. thought it would be fun to take 14 shots of alcohol before I turned 14. And I crawled back to my couch, and I passed out. When I woke up, 
I was in the hospital. If the intake is really, really rapid, um, you know, a kid can, you know, can binge themselves into a, a coma. I mean, you know, kids can, can go into alcohol poisoning because they just drink so much and so rapidly. For some teens, drinking becomes a kind of game, almost like a sport that they can do with their friends. But in reality, it's no game. It minimizes what's actually happening, which is that you're ingesting a quantity of a toxic substance so that it takes on this notion of it's just a game, it's very playful. Some might say that's a rite of passage, but unfortunately it's an unhealthy practice. There are really are very serious consequences of it. The major risk is that you end up drinking more than you thought you were going to. Sometimes you don't know when to stop. You know, you're just caught up in having fun and competing that you kind of lose track, of, I think, of what you're doing. I keep drinking and drinking and drinking to the point where I'll pass out on the floor or start just throwing up everywhere, getting real sick. If you're having five drinks in an hour or two, in a fairly short period of time, your blood levels go uh, above the legal driving limit. And when you get at blood levels significantly above the legal driving limit, you actually start to kill brain cells. You're consuming such a high concentration of alcohol over a short period of time that not only are you going to get the high or the euphoric effect, that it is possible that you may suppress respiration or breathing to the point that someone becomes unconscious and can become, in certain patients, comatose. What happens to a person physically when drinking turns into a race to get drunk? The short answer is nothing good. People get sick, they throw up, they have hangovers, and especially scary sometimes, they can't remember what they drank, who they were with, or what they did while under the influence. Blackouts and drinkers are caused essentially by a too high a level of alcohol. It affects the area of your brain that's responsible for short-term memory, and so that you end up not, literally not remembering what happened to you the night before. A person can look absolutely fine during a blackout. They can be talking, they can be dancing, they can be doing everything, but it's, it's what happens afterwards. They don't remember it, you know, so that the next morning, it's like amnesia. I always wake up with bruises or like, who do I owe apologies to? You know, who did I get in a fight with? Why do I have these bruises on me? Like, why do I have these tickets in my pocket? Uh, like, it's, it was ridiculous. Next thing you know, you wake up the next day and people are like, and you're like, what happened? They're like, you bit this person, you fell through this, you fell through the window. Like, why do I have a bloody nose? You ran, in, you ran into a garage for no apparent reason. Like, and you don't know what happened. The last thing I remember was being in a bar, which I was always at in San Francisco, and the next morning I woke up in Reno. I didn't know how I got there, where I was, and who was lying next to me. And at that point, I thought I should probably know one of those three things, and I didn't. It wasn't fun. Like, I couldn't look back and be like, yeah, I had a good time. I could, couldn't even look back and say what I did. I just don't remember. Over time, drinking alcohol can have a profound effect on your brain and other parts of your body. Alcohol affects brain development. And that we know that if a teenager uh, drinks alcohol, that it will change their normal brain development. Primarily the brain and the liver are affected. The pancreas is uh, affected. Uh, certainly the oral cavity is much more likely to, you're, you're much more likely to have cancers of the mouth, of the throat, of the stomach, and of the liver. Alcohol also damages the central nervous system. That is to say, it produces uh, effects on memory, on recall. Uh, there's a kind of dementia that goes along with regular alcohol use. Alcohol will change normal brain development. And if you change normal brain development, you run the risk of causing problems. But drinking alcohol also changes a person's behavior and its use can create dangerous situations. When the use of alcohol you know, lowers inhibitions and it can certainly be connected with, with, unprotected, with unprotected sex, with, you know, with um, sexual activities with people that ordinarily you know, a person wouldn't be, it wouldn't be involved with. There was a time where I was with a guy in the backyard, like in front of everyone, and I wouldn't have normally allowed anything to go as far as it did had I had not been drinking. It can certainly also increase uh, 
aggression, you know, so that so that a person could be, you know, get into fights and arguments and things like that that otherwise they wouldn't. I fought people that I knew I couldn't beat, you know what I mean? Like, I would just get into every situation I could. Like, when I drank, I was the man. Like, it, it gave me that false impression, like beer muscles. Like, I just was on top of the world and nothing could stop me. In many respects, alcohol creates a false reality for the user, one in which they perceive themselves as often being bigger, badder and smarter than they actually are. This false reality even extends to the notion of sobering up. Let's face it, chicken soup isn't going to cure a cold, and a cup of coffee won't magically remove alcohol from your blood. Drinking coffee or taking a cold shower doesn't sober you up, as many people believe. That's a complete myth. What you do, if, if a drunk takes a shower, you just have a wet drunk. Having a cup of coffee to sober up is most definitely a myth. At best, you'll have a wide awake drunk. If you drink a cup of coffee, get in a car, and drive, your blood alcohol level is the same exact as it was if you didn't have that cup of coffee or didn't take a shower. Time is really the only thing that's going to help someone get sober. If you've been drinking, the alcohol needs to run its course and being processed through your system. And typically, that takes a couple of hours minimum, depending on the amount of alcohol that's been consumed. Many teens find themselves in a situation uh, where maybe they have been drinking even though they shouldn't be and they're afraid to ask for a ride home. They're afraid to call a parent, afraid to talk to an adult and therefore put themselves and their friends in many cases at great risk by getting behind the wheel. The peer pressure is to drink more and it's really not a good thing. I mean it's making good, intelligent, sane young individuals do bad, stupid, crazy things that can have permanent consequences. And they need to sort of put pressure on their peers to be careful, because you don't want to see your friends paralyzed, your friends uh, thrown in jail, or maybe your friends killed because one of your other friends was drunk and driving. With the first drink that a person takes, their, their reflexes are hindered, uh, their motor skills are deteriorated, and their reaction time slows. And you combine that with a car, which is two tons of steel, and you can get into a very dangerous situation very, very quickly. Alcohol is tricky, and it doesn't let you think that you're actually impaired. It doesn't make you think that you can't drive. Many people often say, I drive better when I've been drinking. And of course, that's the, uh, a horrible lie, and they don't. I've had a friend run from the cops when he was drunk. Should have pulled over. Would have been a lot less worse of an outcome if he would have stopped. But he shouldn't have been on the road in the first place, and he shouldn't have been drinking because he was underage. And ended up wrapping his car around a guardrail. And young people need to consider uh, what the rest of their lives will be like uh, if they cause the death or serious injury of another person. I've met people who killed people in an auto accident and they were drunk and they never they never recover from that they know in their mind first of all they get arrested they get they can get thrown in jail often they do their license okay they have those things they recover from that what they never recover from is the knowledge that they really killed somebody well, thousands of young people lose their lives every year by mixing alcohol and automobiles. And although we've made significant gains in this country uh, in, in terms of, of combating uh, drinking and driving, we still have a long way to go. More than 2,000 kids are killed every year in alcohol-related automobile crashes. Christopher was a serious student. He loved playing football and being involved in sports. I had worked late that evening I had spoken with Christopher earlier and he told me that a friend was coming by to pick him up and they were going to go to a young lady's home. Uh, they were just having a little get together. They were drinking. Christopher was drinking as well. They had had a lot to drink and now they were hungry. They just got in this vehicle, did not realize that they were incapable of making a decision, in Christopher's case, whether the driver was okay to drive or not vehicle allegedly flipped over a couple of times, the roof came off, and all eight of the occupants were thrown out. I went into the emergency department, told them who I was, and they proceeded to take me to a room. And a gentleman walked in the room behind me, and he introduced himself as the deputy coroner. And he said, I'm sorry to have to tell you this, but your son Christopher was killed tonight, along with three other young men. He went over across the room, 
and there were drawers. And he pulled out a drawer. And he pulled down a sheet. And he said, is this your son? And my beautiful 17-year-old son that I had kissed goodbye that morning said, have a good day at school, Chris. Was laying there very cold and very stiff, very pale and very dead. And I still couldn't believe it. Christopher, as smart as he was, wasn't smart enough to know that the driver was impaired because Chris was impaired. And when you're impaired yourself, you cannot make a decision about how well someone else can handle a vehicle. In the US today, there are three million kids afflicted with the disease we call alcoholism. Alcoholics are people who just can't stop drinking, even if they wanted to. A kid with this disease will give up family, friends, school, sports, anything, just to keep on drinking. It can come on fast or sneak up on someone over a period of years. And the earlier a kid starts drinking, the higher the risk that he or she will become an alcoholic. It was overcoming me. I had to stop going to school. I had to um, go on antidepressants. I had to actually, I had to rebuild my life and I knew that alcohol couldn't be a part of it anymore. Many teens can develop problems with alcohol and become alcohol dependent. It's not simply a matter of age, gender, race, any of those issues. Alcoholism is something that can affect everyone. Ask any number of health professionals and they'll tell you that more and more young adults and teens are showing up at treatment centers. For all those looking for help, there is hope. And the sooner an alcoholic begins looking for some answers, the better. If or when a kid recognizes they've got a problem with substances, the ideal situation is they ask for some sort of help. Um, this takes a lot of courage. And if they can recognize it with a little bit of courage, they can get the help that's available and they don't have to do it all by themselves. You can all, always go into the yellow pages or the internet and punch in punch in or look up alcohol, alcohol help, and you'll, you'll definitely come up with some resources. But mainly, you just want to find people that you can trust enough to get it out in the open and start having a dialogue about it. Realize that there are a lot of people that are in the same boat, that there's help available, that it's not a moral issue, that it's nothing to be ashamed of. One of the things that's important is education and recognizing that alcohol is a drug it's not something that should be casually experimented with. Physically, it's the most destructive drug an individual can use. With extended use, heavy use, it affects every area of a person's life. It can alter your state of mind, and if you get addicted to it, you'll be more concerned about where you're getting your next beer from than where you're gonna go to college or what you're gonna do with your life. When someone asks me, you know, if I wanna drink or, oh, stop, you know, stop doing all that work, you know, come have fun for once, you know what I'm saying? Like, if I say no, they definitely respect me because, you know, it's like, wow, you know, she's working towards something. She doesn't have to, you know, take a break and drink because I think it's way cooler to just stay away from it and to say no. In many ways, your peer group is a mirror, so if, you, if you're with positive people and responsible people, you'll find yourself not getting into those situations. There are ways not to drink. Find a group of people that don't drink. It might seem like there's nobody out there that, that doesn't drink, but there really is. I, I know from personal experience, I stick to my group of friends now that are going to keep me out of trouble, that want what's in my best interest. I have a direction in my life and I know exactly where I'm going and I'm determined to make it there, so no, I don't drink.